Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here, China History Podcast, episode 257. Seems like number 256 was only two weeks ago. Hey, listen, don't be shy. Join in on all the excitement at patreon.com slash China History Podcast. Sign up. Monthly cost is less than the price of a frozen chicken balti at Sainsbury's. Three bucks, two pounds thirty. Early access to CHP episodes, racy content that would never be accepted in polite society. Patreon.com slash China History Podcast. I thank you in advance. In the powers vested in me as proprietor of this joint, well, you know from time to time I like to introduce the occasional Westerner who had some nexus in their life with some of the history that went on in China. Westerners in China and some of the achievements they had in their careers, well, this always had particular interest to me. I have no idea why. Today's subject, Emily Mickey Han. I believe if you're my generation or the one before, and you've been a longtime reader of the New Yorker magazine, you might have heard of her. And for everyone who has never heard of Emily Han, please allow me to introduce her to you. Quite a character. I didn't have her listed on my most updated list of topics. It was actually one of my listeners of uh, my YouTube channel, Lu Chun Boon, who recommended Emily Hahn. So I figured if there was one listener who was interested in Emily Hahn's story, surely there's another thousand or so. Earlier in the year, I did a three-part series on Kawashima Yoshiko. I don't want to compare the two women except to say their behavior and manner in which they mixed in society (laughs) turned a lot of heads. They both had a great love of lesser apes, gibbons in particular. They were both constantly seen around town with their pet gibbons on their shoulder. It was a crucial part of their particular zaniness. Yoshiko was two years younger than Emily. I'm sure Emily Han knew of Yoshiko, or was at least aware of her. Whether or not these two women ever party together or met in public, can't say. Emily Hahn, perhaps not too well known in our day, but when she was cranking out the essays, articles, novels, history books, and whatnot, especially during the decades following the 1930s, well, she was one of the most widely read women of her time. She was as much known for her wild and crazy antics, scandalous personal life, and unconventional lifestyle as she was for her unique style of writing. She was born in St. Louis, Missouri, January 14th, 1905, the final years of the Qing Dynasty, the poor old Guangxu Emperor. Teddy Roosevelt in the USA, whether it's genetic or how you were raised, some people love to read, and some don't. Emily Hahn, like most all writers, loved to read and got the bug early. She grew up in a family of eight. Her parents were German Jewish immigrants. She had one brother and four sisters. Although I'll refer to her mostly as Emily, she was known throughout her life as Mickey. That was a nickname her mother gave her. I guess she had some resemblance to an old cartoon character, Mickey Dooley. During Emily's second year of high school, the family moved to Chicago, my hometown, and Emily attended Sen High School, located a mere 10 minutes away from the hospital I was born at. Well, I wanted to focus this episode on the years she lived in China and Hong Kong and her role as one of the mansplainers of China to a nation of citizens newly cognizant of this place and hungry to learn more. Her dispatches from China and Hong Kong were many a common American's window to what was going on there. So before we get to the point where, in 1935, her vessel sailed to Shanghai and her China adventure began, let's quickly look at some of the events of her 20s that sort of molded her into what she became for the remainder of her very long life. She studied mining engineering at the University of Wisconsin in idyllic Madison. She had to fight to get in because back in the early 1920s, Engineering was sort of an old boy's profession and not considered a suitable or even appropriate profession for a woman. 1924, she became the first woman to graduate from the engineering school there. Ford was making Model T's between 1908 and 1927. Emily and one of her more adventurous friends drove a Model T cross-country. This was in the spring of 1924, before she graduated. And she wrote letters from the road and mailed them to her brother. 
Her letters were always keepers. She had a way with words. And her brother, recognizing this, forwarded some of these letters to the New Yorker, a relatively new publication back then. With degree in hand, 1926, she put it to good use at Pennzoil, taking on a job in St. Louis, mid-June 1926. But like a lot of us who aspire to certain professions and then find it's not what they thought it'd be, that's how Emily felt about the mining biz. Her friend Dorothy, who had taken that transcontinental road trip with her, got her a job out in Albuquerque as a tour guide. From there, she went to Taos, New Mexico, then a haven for artsy-fartsy spiritual individuals who embraced a bohemian lifestyle, which by now, I guess, described Emily Hahn. Mid-1920s, if there was ever a time when women in America were consolidating the incremental gains of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, this was it. Many women began to spread their wings, and gave some of these hard-fought freedoms a test drive. In January 1928, Emily went back to school and began grad studies at Columbia. She moved into a small hotel room above Times Square and earned some income teaching geology on the side two mornings a week at Hunter College for women. She studied and worked during these lead-up years to the stock market crash on Black Friday 1929, So with a degree from Columbia in hand, Emily Hahn had to wrestle with what to do with her life, especially now that the United States economy had just been turned on its head. One day, a friend asked Emily to write a piece for her that she couldn't take care of due to other commitments. It was for the Sunday World. Emily wrote the article, got published, and she earned 25 bucks for her efforts, and that was the start of her professional writing career. You remember how Emily had written travel letters from the road, 19 years old, crossing the country in a Model T? Well, her brother, or maybe it was her brother-in-law, sent those letters to the New Yorker co-founder, Harold Ross. This was in 1928-29. And he was so impressed with Emily's writing, one after the other, he published these stories in his respected magazine. And Emily, Mickey Hahn... She was given quite a platform to express herself, and she had a lot to say. And over the next 70 years, she got everything off her chest. After a pretty short but destructive period in her life, she ended up sailing for England. From there, she went to Brussels and fell in with this Congolese guy. And then after some spark ignited a keen interest in Africa, she ended up going back to London but dreamed of the Congo. She kept her head above water through a combination of income earned from the New Yorker for her regular articles and the kindness of strangers. Then, as it happens, she took an offer that was too good to pass up with the Red Cross in the middle of nowhere in northwest Congo. She departed from London on Christmas Day, 1930. January 5th, she made it to Dakar, and January 19th, to the mouth of the Congo River, followed by a 14-hour overnight train to Kinshasa. She ultimately hooked up with Dr. Patrick Putnam, their Lake Kivu, right on the border of the DRC in Rwanda. And she ended up staying there for the next 20 months. And it was there that she developed this lifelong fascination and love for primates, and an addiction to fun and adventure. Two years in the Congo... Early 1930s, it was surely a life-changing experience, and after it was all over, it proved to be excellent training for all the challenges that lie ahead. At the end of 1932, she headed to the East Coast, to Dar es Salaam. Congo had been quite an eye-opening experience for Emily, but she still hadn't found what she was looking for. January 1933, she returned to London, fluent in Swahili. In fact, once in a uh, Soho bar, she overheard some chap speaking in Swahili. So she chatted them up, and one of them happened to be a young Jomo Kenyatta, future first president of Kenya and father to the current president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta. She struck up a long-lasting friendship with Jomo Kenyatta. A few weeks afterward... Emily returned to New York and tried to regroup and figure out what to do. She moved up to Woodstock, New York to take a job. 
And then in June of 1933, a book of her African journals, Congo Solo, My Misadventures Two Degrees North, came out. Throughout Emily Hahn's career, she had a lot of literary hits and misses. Then at the age of 28, Emily Hahn wasn't doing too bad. Three books published already, steady income from The New Yorker. She was already very well-traveled and quite educated. Next up for Emily Hahn was an affair with a married Hollywood screenwriter. As we'll see, she sort of had a thing for married men. In the spring of 1934, she headed out to L.A. to be with him, and the relationship progressed, and she accompanied him to London and got all settled there. She studied anthropology at Oxford and continued her writing. Already she was acquiring quite a reputation as the go-to writer for anyone uh, not too offended with sex and interracial love. Early 1935, she made it back to the States, restless as ever, searching. This Hollywood writer turned out to be not the one for Emily Hahn. After a bit of soul-searching, she decided she'd do another stint in the Congo. Belgian Congo back then, later Zaire, and today the Democratic Republic of Congo. After consulting with her sister, Helen, they came up with a plan to head to the Far East first, spend some time there, and then Helen would head back to the States sometime around mid-June, and Emily would keep heading in the direction of Congo. And so Emily Hahn's China story began. March 1935, she and Helen left San Francisco and sailed to Shanghai via Yokohama. By late April of that year, Emily Hahn had done quite well for herself and fell in with a 24-carat crowd, chief among them, Sir Victor Sassoon. Over the years, she would become very close to him. Among other passions, Sir Victor Sassoon was uh, quite a photographer and even got Emily to pose nude for him. They didn't become friendly just because they were a couple of Jews, but eh, that probably didn't hurt. Yeah, if she was uh, hanging out with guys like Victor Sassoon, you can imagine all the other swells she rubbed elbows with at all the lounges and clubs and private soirees and gatherings. She felt right at home amongst this crowd, and though she wasn't for everyone's tastes, she was very much in demand. Well, I guess unless you were destitute, what wasn't there to like about Shanghai during that time? It was One-stop shopping for fun, glamour, culture, sin, excitement, and a big old blast of cosmopolitanism, especially when walking the streets of the International Settlement and French Concession. Those days, 1920s and into the 30s, Shanghai was hard to beat. And many say the same thing in uh, 2020. After acquiring an instant addiction to everything Shanghai had to offer... Emily put her Africa plans on hold. She moved into a flat on Jiangxi Road in the middle of what was then the Red Light District. And in no time at all, her place became a kind of salon for all kinds of intellectuals, artists, officials, leftists, and many from the criminal fringe who embraced this lifestyle. And soon afterwards, she was hired by the leading English-language paper at the time, the North China Daily News. This job allowed all kinds of doors to open and gave Emily access to many greats, near greats, and also rands who made up Shanghai society. If he could say anything about Emily Han, she was a social creature, not shy and always perked up whatever party or event she was attending. Everyone knew she was bosom buddies with Victor Sassoon, so that in itself led to acceptance that, well, otherwise might not have been there. Not long after getting settled and acclimated to her new home for the next few years, Emily met Xiaoxun Mei. Not a well-known name, but in his day he was sort of a character who everyone knew about, and his poetry and writing had earned him a a modicum of admiration. He came from serious money, lived in a gigantic house with an extended family, and lived an extremely privileged life, including years studying in Europe in his late teens and attending Cambridge in his 20s. There, Xiaoxun Mei developed his lifelong passion for Western literature and culture. In most English sources, he's known as Zhao Xin Mei. He was a year younger than Emily. They met at one of these risque 
get-togethers where foreign and Chinese intellectuals would gather and enjoy some witty conversation. I guess you could say Emily Han was uh, predisposed to do crazy, daring, and unconventional things. Today, no one thinks twice about it, but in the mid-1930s, Western women openly engaging in an intimate relationship with a Chinese man, mm, no one didn't stare at that. And very few didn't have strong opinions, especially when one of the mixed couples was already married with children. Nonetheless, they fell for each other. Xiaoxian Mei's shtick was that. He preferred to dress always in traditional Chinese robes and garments. He was one good-looking chap, too. Even Lu Xun had commented once in one of his writings about uh, Xin Mei's handsome looks, and Shanghai society was plenty shocked at how openly Emily carried on this relationship. She didn't care who saw them together. Xiaoxian Mei took her to his home, introduced her to his wife and family. And then Sin Mei introduced her to the evils of the opium pipe, and, well, like it's been known to happen with narcotic drugs, she developed a nice healthy addiction. And for the next couple years, she found herself waking and baking regularly. However, like many addicts and alcoholics are capable of doing, she was able to carry on her daily life and new career, as well as keep up with a regular submission of articles for The New Yorker. In September 1935, Emily bought a monkey, a gibbon. She knew it was a gibbon because some man named Mr. Mills had told her so, and so she named her pet Mr. Mills. And she took this animal wherever she went, as I mentioned, just like Kawashima Yoshiko. And to ensure Mr. Mills was never lonely, she added other gibbons to her collection, and predictably they took over her place and were always escaping out the window and creating trouble with the neighbors. So, 1935, 1936, and into the terrible year of 1937, Emily got to revel in the last days of old Shanghai, hanging out and partying with Victor Sassoon and his glitzy crowd, getting high all the time, writing for the North China Daily News, and all her dispatches to the New Yorker and the witty vignettes about life all around her were wildly popular. And she created this fictional character named Pan He Ven, who was loosely based on the character of Xiao Xun Mei. And she had more or less moved in with his family and got to be a kind of fly on the wall, observing up close all the gears and mechanisms that drove the Xiao family. She used a lot of these observations in her popular Pan He Ven stories that uh, New Yorker readers couldn't get enough of. And Sin Mei's family had given her a Chinese name, Xiang Mei Li. She still maintained her flat on Jiangxi Road that had long become the late-night hangout joint for Xiao Xin Mei and all his retinue of friends and hangers-on. And there were quite a few communists as well who were laying low in these post-Shanghai massacre days. Zhou Enlai had mixed with Emily once or twice, and allegedly Mao Zedong as well. And all the action that went on in her living room in this part of Shanghai's red light district provided endless fodder for fascinating pieces that she submitted regularly to the New Yorker. And by this time, Emily Han, mostly known as Mickey Han, she had become the sole lifeline for many American intellectuals and readers of the New Yorker who were interested to know about China and about all the ominous news that they occasionally heard about. Back then wasn't like now, where everybody's practically a journalist. The income from her writing covered her nut as far as her opium supply and all the daily necessities of life. But by and large, Emily was highly dependent on the generosity of friends and others who picked up the tab at the end of the night. And like her lover, Xiao Xin Mei, she too became a local character who everyone knew by sight, and many notable persons passing through Shanghai had at least heard of her. During the autumn of 1935, she quit her gig at the North China Daily News and started teaching English at some college. This work made much less demands on her life and allowed her to more fully enjoy her daily opium pipes. Emily kept on pushing the envelope as far as lifestyle excesses went. She was always game for anything, dangerous liaisons included. 
and though Jewish herself, Emily Hahn didn't mix or get too involved with the Jewish refugees who were starting to wend their way to Shanghai. She wasn't part of all that drama. August to November 1937 were four months to remember in Shanghai. All the good times that Emily Hahn and others had enjoyed up till now came to a crashing end. Emily moved into a flat inside the international settlement to escape the worst of the bombing and destruction of the Battle of Shanghai. Not long after, she moved again to the French concession. And then on November 8th, 1937, after putting up a valiant defense, the Nationalist Army abandoned Shanghai to its fate. As far as Emily's relationship with Xiaoxun Mei, or Sin Mei as she called him, that started to feel some strain. Like a lot of the Chinese gentry of Shanghai, the Shaos lost everything and were borderline destitute, slumming it in some cottage not far from Emily's flat in the French concession. Sin Mei proposed they get married. Polygamy was legal still, and under Chinese law, Sin Mei could take a second wife. The marriage wouldn't be recognized under American law. This essentially made Emily a concubine, but she decided to go along with the whole thing. Under these new circumstances, her marriage to a Chinese national yielded some benefits that might come in handy one day, and in fact did. And so all the proper documents were signed, sealed, and delivered. You can't say the tongue started wagging because Emily and Sin Mei's relationship was well known in expat communities inside and outside Shanghai. A famous American journalist, making no effort to conceal her relationship with a married Chinese man, with Mr. Mills and these other primates who lived with her. And did I mention she liked a good cigar? And that was another one of her famous eccentricities. As far as her opium habit, she had the same battle cry as all addicts. I can stop whenever I want to. Yeah, easier said than done. Not that your humble narrator ever partook. After hitting that pipe as regularly as she had, a couple years now, Emily eh, wasn't looking too good. The addiction was taking its toll on not only her health, but her appearance as well. But like a walking drunk, she kept on keeping on, churning out pieces for the New Yorker and penning novels and works of nonfiction. And then one day, a Captain Charles Boxer walked into her life. He was quite an extraordinary man in his own right. Boxer was head of British Army Intelligence, based in Hong Kong. He had heard about Emily, was rather intrigued, and came up to Shanghai for a look-see. The timing wasn't the best, you know, between Sin Mei, the monkeys, and all the people that popped in and out of Emily's daily life. Well, Boxer left with less than a favorable impression. But despite that, there was some kind of mutual attraction. And he definitely was interested to see her again. Then came April of 1938. Emily was still making a living teaching English when the noted journalist and author John Gunther came calling. Gunther had suggested to her that she write a book about the three Song sisters, Ai Ling, Ching Ling, and Mei Ling. Emily wasn't initially keen on the idea, but with a number of publishers showing interest in the potential book, clamoring to get her to sign with them, well, she knew, oh, this one had potential. Her last book had bombed, and she was just barely getting by on the New Yorker articles and the income from teaching. Sin May may have been down and out, but he still had excellent connections about town. He was able to get to a relative who was close to Song Ai Ling, who was able to convince her to meet with Emily to discuss the book idea. Ching Ling never responded to Emily's request to interview. And let me say, Sun Yat-sen's widow knew all about Emily and her antics and reputation around Shanghai, and she never liked her nor had anything to do with her, and was dead set against letting her into the secret Song world. Song Mei Ling, Madame Jiang Kai-shek, well, she had responded to Emily's inquiries, but had politely turned her down. Ai Ling, the oldest and, many say, the most brilliant of the three amazing sisters, she was mulling the whole idea over about a positive portrayal of her and her sisters by a popular and well-known American writer. June 1939, Emily went and visited Song Ai Ling at a hotel in Hong Kong. 
and Emily learned the Song sisters were not at all pleased with the press they had been given and thought they had been smeared and passed books written about them. Ai Ling was anxious to get something positive written about them to counter all the negative, and that's when Emily had been introduced to her. And that's why Song Ai Ling convinced her sisters, well, Mei Ling at least, to offer Emily access and cooperation. The following month, she was back in Shanghai with Sin Mei. Whilst in Hong Kong, she had hooked up with Charles Boxer again, and they had a pleasant meeting. Emily Han had to do some serious thinking. She now had this book opportunity, and she had to do something about the 12 times a day she was hitting that opium pipe. Aside from seriously hurting herself physically and mentally, not to mention her chances of ever getting pregnant, should she desire that, well, the nationalist government had recently instituted very harsh and draconian laws against addicts. So in the late summer of 1939, she finally took serious action, checked into a drug rehab clinic, and kicked that wicked habit. Again, not that I ever personally experienced it, but... I heard coming down off a years-long opium habit isn't easy or pleasant. But Emily was determined, and she was able to put that behind her. And she looked at Sin Mei, still hopelessly addicted, and for many more years than she had been. And she saw him for what he had become, a hopeless drug addict. With this wind in her sails, feeling renewed from finally getting this other monkey off her back, Emily, end of 1939 set out for Hong Kong to get working on the Song Sisters book. Once in Hong Kong, Song Ai Ling had arranged for a flight to the now wartime capital of China in Chongqing. There, Emily was able to meet the youngest sister, Mei Ling, at the presidential compound. You know, there was a a funny story that happened when Emily was sitting with the First Lady of China. Her husband, Jiang Kai-shek, wandered into the room, unaware Mei Ling had a guest. And he waltzed in, wearing his slippers, no false teeth in, and not appearing like you would normally see him in a photograph. And he saw Emily sitting there and quickly, you know, turned heels and excused himself, no doubt wondering who the hell was that Western person in his living room talking to his wife. Emily and Song Mei Ling got on famously. After all the ground rules were meticulously laid out by Madame Chiang, they went right at it and a series of interviews followed. Emily's ten weeks or so in Chongqing were fun-filled with plenty of action. A lot of people, especially in the expat community, knew who she was and sought her out. There were also plenty of bombing raids and close calls. Chongqing was the wartime capital of China, and the Japanese bombed the place mercilessly. And then the following year, mid to late February 1940, She hitched a ride with all three Song sisters and flew back to Hong Kong, which, after all the death, destruction, and stressful living of Chongqing, was a veritable breath of fresh air. And then in April, the three famous sisters, in a show of unity and patriotism, flew back together to Chongqing. Ai Ling dragged Emily along where she enjoyed carte blanche to all kinds of interesting and historic things happening. In the meantime, a fire had been lit under her relationship with Charles Boxer. Each time they met, it was easy for both of them to tell that there was something happening between them. Back in Chongqing, it was daily air raids with one close call when Emily's hotel got hit and her room was destroyed with the Song sister's manuscript inside. Fortunately, someone had been able to retrieve it when digging through the rubble. She remained in Chongqing, finishing up the Song Sisters book and having a blast partying with the expat community there. The summer of 1940, Emily found herself in the company of Song Mei Ling quite regularly. And fortunately, the book manuscript had met with the First Lady's approval, and by late July, the book was finished. Emily then thought, nah, it wouldn't be such a bad idea to head back to Hong Kong and then make her way back to America after these seven years in China. With that in mind, she went back to Hong Kong, and then at once she began seeing Charles Boxer, and their relationship became more open and obvious. Just as the tongues wagged when she was openly carrying on a relationship with Sin Mei, so they were again with Emily having an obvious relationship with the 
still married Charles Boxer. Charles had convinced Emily to put her plans to return to America on hold and that she should go send for her monkeys and stay with him in Hong Kong. He'd divorce his wife, marry her, and they'd have a kid. And by early 1941, sure enough, Emily was pregnant. Everyone in Hong Kong society had something to say about that. When she met with Ernest Hemingway, who was in town staying at the Repulse Bay, he had told Emily he'd be more than willing to say that the kid was his in order to divert attention from her relationship with Charles Boxer. Despite the scandalousness of the pregnancy, neither Emily nor Charles cared to do a thing to hide the affair. His wife wasn't giving in to the divorce idea, but as soon as she got word of Emily's pregnancy, well, as it is in most cases of infidelity, that did the trick. And then in the spring of 1941, the Song sisters' book was published. This was her first great success. It was commercially successful, and the timing for a book like this couldn't have been more perfect. Emily had done well in making a name for herself as the New Yorker's China Coast correspondent. But the Song sisters' book took her to the next level. This book ended up being the window to China that Americans were thirsting for at that time. 1941 wasn't like today with some new China-related book being published every day, it seems. There wasn't much available on the subject of modern China, and people across the states depended on Emily to be their eyes and ears in that part of the world. She was already well-known, but with this book, she had really arrived. She lived up on May Road in the mid-levels with Mr. Mills and two other Gibbons shipped down from Shanghai, and so they wouldn't be lonely, she purchased three more in Hong Kong. Emily appeared in public, quite visibly pregnant. This was the summer of 1941, and there was a terrible feeling of dread amongst the people there about what was about to happen. China had been enduring four years of horror at the hands of the Japanese, and now it seemed it wasn't long before Hong Kong would get a taste of that as well. Emily's due date was in October, and on the 17th of that month, Carola Militia Boxer was born. Emily had managed to survive the bombings that went on during the Battle of Shanghai, and much more of the same when she was in Chongqing. Now, for the third time, it was looking like more war was heading in her direction. And in December... Following the attack on Pearl Harbor and elsewhere in Asia, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere descended on Hong Kong. And for the next couple of years, Emily was among the many foreigners who couldn't get out in time. That was pretty bad in itself, but with a two-month-old baby to care for, well, that took the whole drama to a different level. You surely remember from that award-winning 10-part CHP History of Hong Kong series the heroism and bravery exhibited by the British, Canadian, and Indian troops in defending Hong Kong was valiant. But at this early stage of the war, there was no stopping Japan. Emily did her best to try and be useful and helped out the nurses at War Memorial Hospital, where 51 years later my daughter would be born. And after December 8th, darkness fell upon Hong Kong and elsewhere. And by Christmas 1941, it was all over. And in the fighting, Charles had been shot and was ailing in a hospital. Despite the risks, well, you know how love is. Emily tracked down Charles and hardly ever left his side, nursing him and attending to his needs for as long as the Japanese allowed. But in the end, she had to go back and take care of their newborn and leave Charles to his fate. Let me mention one important thing about Charles Boxer. Quite an interesting chap, besides his illicit love affair with Emily Hahn. He was fluent in Japanese and a scholar of history and literature. I guess you could call him a Japanophile. As a gaijin learning that language, how can you not be? He practiced kendo and other Japanese martial arts. He didn't live strictly by any code of Bushido, but during his years in captivity, although he suffered greatly... The Japanese seemed to have some kind of begrudging respect for him. And because of this, it probably allowed both himself and Emily and their baby to survive the ordeal. January 1942, after a period of relatively comfortable limbo, the foreigners were rounded up and put into camps. Again, 
This may have been because of the secret admiration the Japanese had for Charles Boxer. Maybe not, but Emily was able to take advantage of a loophole in the regulations regarding nationality. According to Chinese law, the wife took on the husband's nationality in the case of marriage. Back in 1937, when she became Sinmei's second wife, or concubine, well, she had signed a legal document attesting to the union. It was worthless in an American court, but for whatever reasons, the Japanese authorities gave her a pass, and she didn't get interned with all the other foreigners. As far as the Japanese saw her, she was a Chinese national. Well, you could say she dodged a bullet by not having to deal with the unpleasantness of the internment camps, but on the other hand, well, she was mostly on her own now, with an infant on her knee and often trigger-happy Japanese soldiers around every corner. Her Chinese servant, Ah Ging. Well, let me just say, throughout this period, he had been instrumental in Emily's daily survival. During the horrible year of 1942, Emily visited Charles in his hospital ward every day. She had to beg, borrow, or steal to get whatever food she could for herself and Charles. Book royalties were pouring into her bank account. But the Japanese had frozen all banking and she couldn't get access to anything. So to make ends meet and curry favor for the sake of Charles, Emily agreed to daily English lessons for some Japanese officers. They paid her with food rations that meant life and death for her and Charles throughout this period. Her one particular benefactor was Takio Oda. Without his support, Emily and her baby Carola probably would have perished in the internment camps. Trying to get her hands on milk powder for her baby was always an ordeal. And after spending the first couple years of her life under such conditions, baby Carola was malnourished and undersized for her age. Emily didn't know this, of course, but family and colleagues back in the States were trying furiously to arrange for her and Carola to be included in one of the many prisoner swaps that were arranged, usually through the Red Cross. Her sister Helen had been working constantly to get Emily released. In the fall of 1942, one of these exchanges was arranged, but Emily refused to leave Charles' side. And it wasn't just Charles. With Emily on the outside like she was, she was able to scrounge for all kinds of food and other items interred prisoners were desperate for. She didn't collaborate with the Japanese, and whatever they tried to get out of her wasn't of any use. But she was able to cleverly leverage this special relationship, or whatever you want to call it, with the Japanese authorities to get them to look the other way when she was obviously providing help and sustenance to certain internees. And then end of 1942, for the first time, Allied warplanes started appearing in the skies above Hong Kong. Although the Japanese did their best to hide any sign that they were faltering, these were clear indications that something was happening. And also during this time, Emily lost poor old Mr. Mills, her pet gibbon. Those two had gone through quite a lot together. In time, Charles was released from the hospital and transferred to the Argyle Street internment camp for officers. And for Charles and other officers locked up inside with them, Emily became their lifeline, bringing them whatever scraps of food she could purchase from the black market with funds she earned from doing odd jobs. Early 1943, things changed. Around now, the tide was clearly turning, and the impending doom felt by some in Japan caused a complete change in attitude towards prisoners and internees. As you recall from that Hong Kong history series, one of the things the Japanese did was to empty out Hong Kong of as many residents as possible. This meant less mouths to feed and people to manage. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong people were forced to march north into Guangdong province to fend for themselves or live off their relatives. Emily's benefactor, Takio Oda, he ended up getting transferred out of Hong Kong, but his successor continued to keep an eye out for her and had told her to lay low because she was being watched constantly and there were those who were certain she was an Allied spy. 
And one of the other changes was that her access to Charles was now severely restricted to the point where it was near impossible to see him. They were only able to exchange occasional messages. Charles strongly urged her to get out while she could, leave Hong Kong, head to America, and after the war he'd find his way there and they'd finally get married. She was able to see Charles one last time. He was in deplorable shape and from the looks of it might not last that much longer. So when she said goodbye, well, she didn't know if she'd ever see him again. And on September 23rd, 1943, her Red Cross vessel carried her and Carola away on the first leg of their journey back to New York. Her eight-year China adventure was coming to a close. On November 30th of that same year, she arrived in New York. And after an unpleasant greeting from suspicious FBI interrogators... Emily and Carola were able to reunite with her sister Helen, who had not seen her since 1935 when Helen's boat sailed from Shanghai back to the U.S. Well, we're running way long already, and I don't want to split this one up into two parts. Allow me to do a patented CHP rush to the finish once uh, Emily returned to the U.S. Over the next two months, She regurgitated everything that she had experienced and recalled over the course of her ordeal, and all manners of articles, interviews, and short stories were published. And the perfect timing of the Song Sisters book was repeated again with the memoir of her experiences. This book was entitled China to Me, aside from offering a lot of insight into Japan's actions in China, well, she let it all hang out and owned up to everything, her, her opium addiction, the, the marriage to Sin May, committing adultery with Charles, and having a baby out of wedlock. All commonplace in the 21st century, but in the 1940s, this took the word scandal to a whole new level. There was always a boatload of detractors sniping away at Emily. Conservatives they couldn't stand her for obvious reasons. But all the controversies did wonders for book sales and made Emily a very in-demand guest on radio shows as well as newspaper and magazine interviews. China, to me, was a huge sensation when it was published in the fall of 1944 and sold over 700,000 copies. She didn't make any friends among leftists. Emily had nothing good to say about the Chinese communists and leftists in general. And later on, after Japan's surrender and in the midst of the Chinese Civil War, she was a solid supporter of the Nationalists. She went from all those years of hardship in Shanghai, Chongqing, and Hong Kong to an 11-room townhouse in Manhattan, flush with royalties that had accumulated over the years. Financially, she was doing great But all that hard living, the bombing, the starvation rations during 1942 and 43, well, physically, she was a wreck, and she had a number of serious health scares. And all the while, ever since the moment she left Charles in Hong Kong in 1943, Emily had no idea if he was dead or alive. She'd hear rumors the Japanese shot him or he had died of disease, and then she'd get word that someone had recently seen him alive. Sin May had contacted her around this time. He had managed to survive the occupation, which was starting to wind down. He would remain in China and died in 1968 in poverty after years of suffering one mass campaign after another and trying to kick his lifelong drug habit. September 4th, 1945, Emily finally got word Charles had survived and was recovering in Hong Kong after being liberated from an internment camp at Guangzhou. In November of that year, the Hong Kong government formally recognized Emily Han for her gallant sacrifice in risking her life to bring food and other necessities to occupants in the POW and internment camps during the occupation. Charles had survived, surely thanks to his fluency and scholarship of Japanese and the stoicism with which he resigned himself to his fate. I guess well, the Japanese, they just, they just couldn't bring themselves to kill him. So, happy ending, November 22nd, 1945. Charles flew to New York and was reunited with Emily and their daughter. Life magazine did a whole big spread on the happy family, who had all 
survive such a devastating time during the war. Less than a week later, Emily and Charles married up in the state of Connecticut. She continued her writing and was very prolific during this post-war period. She was one of the go-to journalists for anything related to China, the Civil War, and as an eyewitness to the horrors that visited China during the 30s and 40s. She turned out one China-related book after another, and also books not about China. If you remember CNN's Mike Chinoy after Tiananmen, June 4th, 1989, well, anything that concerned China, he was, well, for a while, the Walter Cronkite of China-related news. You know, back then, you didn't have all these Bill Bishops and David Mosers and Evan Fagenbaums and Kaiser Guos who had such understanding and insight about China. Well, in the USA, in any case, on a national level, 1940s, we were only just beginning to get acquainted with China. So you had to start somewhere. And writers like Emily Hahn played their part. End of July, 1946, Emily and Charles moved to England. He had inherited a 48-acre estate and was offered a professorship at the University of London. Their second child, Amanda, was born on October 20th, 1948. Emily was 44. Early 1950, this storybook marriage started to show some strain, and they had to get creative about how to save it. After all they had gone through together, well, they couldn't just end it. Emily went back to New York and continued to write for The New Yorker. Charles remained in London and continued his teaching. And Emily Mickey Hahn... She kept on writing for The New Yorker pretty much until the day she died. Harold Ross, William Sean, Robert Gottlieb, Tina Brown. She worked for all of them. These years, from 1950 to 1970, were her most prolific. And she was a legend at The New Yorker, a permanent fixture in her tiny, modest office near the elevator. She wrote 181 articles for them between 1929 and 1996. Because of all her well-documented experiences there and for some of the work she left behind, people in the States back then associated with her with China. She had been the gateway to China for so many ordinary and, dare say, extraordinary American people. Late 1996, Emily had a bad fall in her apartment. 91 years old. I guess so many of us know from our own personal family experiences. Well, for the elderly, eh, that's usually the beginning of the end. After another serious fall, she never recovered and died on February 18th, 1997. Her daughter Carola was at her bedside. 92. 1905 to 1997. That's a heck of a run if you ask me. As for her beloved, Charles Boxer, well, if you check his Wikipedia entry, it states he was, quote, a historian of Dutch and Portuguese maritime and colonial history. In Hong Kong, he was the chief spy of British Army intelligence in the tumultuous years leading up to World War II. But it is his lead role in one of the most flamboyant public love stories of the 1940s, his romance with Emily Hahn author, and one of the New Yorker's most prolific contributors that accounts for most of his fame. End quote. Emily Mickey Han. Well, she didn't make any Chinese history, but she sure did live through some. August to November 1937 in Shanghai, 1939 in Chongqing, 1940 to 43 Hong Kong. Plenty of other foreigners lived through all that too, but Emily Han was remembered as one of the more articulate and approachable writers of that time, and she gave her readership a nicely unvarnished look at what was happening during these most difficult years. And she did it with a style all her own. And Emily lives on as an inspiration to anyone, woman or man, who wants to seize the day and go out into the world and live by their own rules. I'll have links to some of her work, as well as the uh, books I've mentioned in this episode. I was talking to Graham Earnshaw the other night. Earnshaw Books recently published American socialite Ruth Day's limited edition book with her descriptions of Shanghai during the weeks she spent there in 1935. 
high-def, first-hand accounts. I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Shanghai 1935. Earnshaw Books, my good-looking listeners. Books about China and occasionally beyond. Well, next time when we convene, I will be going way, way back to Tiempos Antiguos, and we'll look at someone pretty, pretty important in his time. Sort of glossed over him in past episodes. Okay, I already pitched you about Patreon at the outset. No need to mention that a second time here. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Smoky L.A. Wishing you all the very best. I'm so appreciative that you all fit me into your life. So much other great stuff out there. Okay, come back again in two weeks for what's sure to be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.